views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Talk. In November, one of tonight's guests authored a three-part series in the Norwood News about heroin in the Bronx, ringing an alarm bell that many had thought was no longer necessary. Three weeks ago, in a Riverdale apartment, authorities arrested two men and seized more than $154 million worth of heroin. And then just two weeks later, another large bust of five men and $5 million worth of the killer drug was made in a Kingsbridge apartment. It might be a revelation for some that in 2013 and 14 in New York City, more people died from heroin overdoses than murder. It's one of New York's biggest killers, and unfortunately, the Bronx neighborhoods of Fordham, Tremont, and Mott Haven were among the five in the city with the most heroin deaths. And if that's not enough, experts are expressing great concern about the availability and use throughout the Bronx of K2, a synthetic drug. So that's what we've got tonight, heroin, K2, and drug use in the Bronx. If you want to call in with questions or comments, then pick up the phone and call us at 718-960-7261. Or you can ask questions and make comments in an email to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org, or you post them on our Facebook page, and we will read them on the air during a future edition of our program. For the here and now, the editor of the Norwood News and author of the articles I was talking about, The State of Heroin in the Bronx, welcome back to David Cruz. Nice to have you. Thank you. And also the executive director of VIP Community Services, one of the Bronx's largest and most important treatment centers. Deborah Vizi, good evening, and thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Ms. Vizi, let's uh, start with you. Give me an overview of what's going on in the Bronx. I mean, many people would say, wait a minute, I thought that heroin thing was, you know, and well, I know there's a problem, but it's not that large a problem. Is it a large problem? How large a problem? And why now, maybe, as opposed to in the recent past? Well, I think heroin is not necessarily resurging in any way. I think it's been a tried and true drug uh, in the drug community for many, many years. You know, I analogize heroin to like aspirin. It's a tried and true drug and its resurgence is really based on availability and cost and familial, perhaps drug dealing within families, if you would. Most of the drug use that we're seeing at VIP Community Services is being perhaps solicited or given by their own families, either their parents or their uncles or brothers. That's what we're seeing. You're actually, you know, you mentioned it to me before the show. Uh, certainly it was mentioned in um, uh, David Cruz's uh, work. But this is a fascinating thing that, that people within families are passing heroin along. Right, and I think it's primarily and based on... And you know on this because of your experience working uh, with people who are addicted and need treatment. Yeah, absolutely. Most of the folks, I would say probably nine times out of ten, are being doctored, as the term is on the street, um, into heroin through family members. Uh, and I think it's primarily based on cost. I mean, we've seen a lot of young people come in who are trying other drugs, but from a cost perspective can't afford it. And heroin is much more affordable, and it gives a longer high, and it's much more attractive. You know, I was looking at the, um, uh, uh, the uh, drug busts that they recently did, and I said, wow, all that, you know, in, in Bronx apartments, in Bronx neighborhoods, 
those drugs were going somewhere. It's not right. like they existed and then they were just, you know, not going to be affecting our community. Right. So when you talk about availability, I think I think it's it's right there. The other thing that came up, uh, not only in David's reporting and other research that I did, was that um, many people who have turned to heroin initially got hooked on prescription painkillers first, and then those either they can't get prescriptions for them or they find a cheaper high. Is this something else that you're finding? Well, the chemical properties of, let's say, an oxycodone or some opiate and a benzodiazepine, such as, like, let's say, Valium or Xanax, the combination of the two are very similar to the properties of heroin. So we're finding that as a substitute uh, or addicts using it as a substitute. It's also easily available to them on the street or through a doctor's office. I don't, I don't want to um, uh, delay too much before we bring uh, Mr. Cruz into the conversation, but this notion of families passing it along, I, I don't want to leave that just yet. How does that work? How does that happen? I mean, many people would say, well, if a, a, a teenager, let's say, or a young adult has a problem with it, presumably it would be the family that would be trying to help them. But what you're suggesting is that within families, maybe a father or mother or whomever, is passing it along to their children. Is this true? Yes. I mean, we're seeing some genera we're seeing some generational use. We're seeing um, young parents or parents that have either given their children, like for example, we have a client who was given heroin as a young child when she was crying. And, now, and why would parents do that? Unaware that this is, uh, you know, a, a killer drug, or they actually think this is something that's good? I think addicted themselves and wow. saw this as a panacea of some kind. I mean, that's certainly one way. This uh, is eye-opening to me, and I'm sure eye-opening to anybody who's uh, watching our program right now, and, and you're hearing it uh, you know, firsthand of somebody who deals with it. So, David Cruz, um, you decided to write about it and do a three-part series on something which I will frankly tell you, and we know the conversation we had. You said, did you read my article? And I was <laughs> like, well, why? You know, it's just a, another story. But you seemed to be on to something, and you knew something was happening. How did you know, and why did you do the work you did? Well, I was actually going through statistics from the New York City Department of Health, and I was looking at heroin overdoses uh, throughout the five boroughs, and I noticed that uh, Bronx was number one in terms of the number of uh, deaths associated with heroin use. Mm -hmm. And so I said, then, there's got to be something here. There's definitely a story that hasn't necessarily been told. And, and quite frankly, I kind of thought that three, a three-part series wasn't enough. I think you could write a whole book on this issue, particularly as it pertains to the Bronx. Mm. And so um, when I just dug that nugget of information, I said, you know what, maybe this, this requires a little more exploration. And other uh, outlets had done it, but none no actual uh, Bronx newspaper or Bronx outlet has actually looked into this, um, as far as I can tell anyway. Um, it was definitely something I wanted to really take on. Uh, I'm, I, I was fascinated by many of the findings in, in the work that you did. Uh, Hispanic men aged between 35 to 54 are most vulnerable to legal heroin overdoses. So that's not the, the stereotype of teenagers and people in their low 20s, let's Correct. say. Um, and in 2013, Hispanic men contributed to 65% of heroin overdoses, which was a spike from the year before when the rate uh, was uh, 56%. What were some of the things um, that you learned about on the trail, aside from the, the numbers that I just quoted, that, that you know, alarmed you or made you say, wow, we're really on to something important here? Well, um, some of the things I ended up finding is that uh, heroin use sort of overlaps in areas of poverty. And uh, when I was going through the South Bronx, and of course South Bronx is one of the poor districts in the country, I was passing a, a park, Millbrook Playground, and I saw people sleeping there. I saw people uh, with appeared to be like going on a high. It was kind of, it was pretty scary. Mm -hmm. And um, looking through it, I kind of said, okay, well, I noticed that it does happen in these poor neighborhoods and it doesn't seem to have ever sort of um, been detached from that. It sort of seemed to have been a problem in 2000 and the, and the years before that as well. Well, that's what we heard from Ms. Vizi that it's not like, well, all of a sudden, it's really been a continuum. Uh, I, I thought one of the things you said was, uh, cruel almost and sad and it was greatly disturbing and one of the reasons why I said we had to talk about this that what you just described the scene you just described 
Um, and you said the heroin epidemic is, simply seems accepted in the Bronx. And so maybe so many of us who will go by a park and see people sleeping in it, which we do see, there is homelessness, and maybe never make the connection. But you're saying if we find out it's heroin, people in the Bronx are like, well, yeah, that's the problem we have. Right. So if it's not in your face, if it's you know not going to be in existence, but the crazy part is that it is. I mean, I tend to sort of notice that it happens in, um, in really quiet areas. Sort of Hunts Point is sort of like on the outskirts of almost everything, and yet there's a place called the Brickyard where a lot of people end up using, and they tend to congregate over there, but a, you know, a non-user would actually would not go there. And so if it's not, if, if it's sort of out of sight, it's out of mind in that case. If you know it's there and you went to visit it and you don't even live there, there must be community people, community board people, elected officials, neighborhood people, and all other people who know that it's there. Did you find that people in the Bronx know it's there and, and don't look at it, don't notice it, or as unfortunately we just said, well, it's just kind of accepted in the Bronx, well, that's just drug use. I would say if you're a non-user, you wouldn't go to a brickyard, to the brickyard. <laughs> um, I understand that. And so, I mean, the cops are aware of it. They really can't do anything about it except if they see dealing taking place, they'll go ahead and arrest them, but they can't go ahead and, and arrest someone who is on a high. It's just... Right. They sort of tend to just shrug it off. Ms. Vizi, let's talk about um, some of the quote-unquote answers. Um, uh, years ago, uh, we thought methadone was, was the big solution. Would you talk to me about either that kind of treatment or other kind of treatments that you use? Well, certainly, I mean, there's a whole host of medication interventions now that didn't exist before. I mean, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around methadone. Um, methadone has been around for many, many years. And if you and I were talking about the fact that I was eating less French fries today to control my, my health or weight, you would think that was acceptable. But when we talk about heroin and we're saying this is a harm reduction model or a medication intervention that helps reduce the risk of usage, um, it's still stigmatized as being a drug or something that is a substitute that's unhealthy. But what we see, and we have a thousand methadone patients that come to VIP community services every a thousand. a day. A day. I'm, I'm just repeating that for emphasis mm -hmm. so people will understand. This is right. a lot larger than what anybody thought. Oh, absolutely. And um, I do think that, you know, we have very good citizens in the Bronx that do recognize the problem. And I think the whole issue in Riverdale really speaks to the fact that um, the Bronx is just entering an era that other suburbs and other parts of the tri-state area have been experiencing for some time. But, but back to, you know, the core issue about both Suboxone and methadone. Both, both, both boast a very strong efficacy around success, around lack of usage or you know illegal usage. And one of the great things about methadone programs is that we not only monitor doses, we look to titrate people off methadone if they're capable of doing that. That's our certainly our hope. But mm -hmm. for some people, they may need to be maintained on a particular dosage to avoid illegal use. Now, there's a, a, a drug that David uh, wrote about, uh, Naloxone. Uh, naloxone. Mm -hmm. Just pronounce that for me. Naloxone. Naloxone. Uh, is that something you use? Is that something that is the wave of the future of treatment? Well, Suboxone and Methadone are generally the things that VIP community services are using. All of these kinds of things are, you know, interventions that, you know, are harm reducers. That's the, that's the hope. Uh, David, you uh, uncovered that uh, there is a Bronx uh, assembly member that has put this uh, on his radar, that he, uh, he wants to uh, see it made more accessible. Uh, Def definitely. It's uh, Assemblyman Jeff Dinowitz. He, uh, he's basically introduced a bill to expand the use of naloxone simply because it's a way to reverse the effects of an overdose. And so it's actually sort of running in tandem with Governor Cuomo, who's sort of really... I have to say he's really taking the lead in trying to quell the uh, heroin epidemic, although I kind of keep thinking that he's definitely gearing it more towards this new second generation of heroin users, which is mostly um, folks coming from middle class uh, backgrounds. Um, but even so, he's giving, he's pumping in about $8 million um, to uh, programs across the uh, state, 
and one of them is a more expanded use of naloxone, not only for uh, SUNY and CUNY officers, but also to school nurses as well. You would like to see that? Well, I think that, you know, it's certainly a very helpful intervention. Uh, what I see is what's happening on the ground, and addicts will not generally use this. They don't want to be responsible for res resuscitating anyone wow. um, mm -hmm. or possibly being involved with the police in any way. So although this is available and we discuss it very openly with our patients, a lot of them aren't taking you know, the good advice from professionals to use it because of potential other issues that well, may arise. And, and I want to add to that too because um, I ended up doing another a part of uh, the heroin series that was not affiliated with three-part series. It was about New York harm reduction, um, a group that's based in the South Bronx that goes out and uh, does a needle exchange. Right. And a lot of them, I found that they don't want to deal with the police despite the fact there are good Samaritan laws in place. You won't get in trouble if you go and call the police and have them... Uh, I, I will uh, tell you, and I'm, I'm somewhat proud, that when we started this program 20 years ago, one of the first programs we ever did was about uh, needle exchange programs. So mm. at that time, uh, ahead of the curve. Mm. Nonetheless, before we go further, I, I do want to go uh, to the telephone. Aldo Perez from the Northeast Bronx. Uh, Dawa is with us. Uh, Dawa is with us. And um, so I want to say hello to Aldo. Is Aldo with us? They're telling me to go to Bob from Riverdale first. I wanted to take Aldo. Bob, uh, what you got? What's going on? Either one. Give me any phone call. Okay, now. Yes. Gary, in the past, the uh, authorities have told us that marijuana use and other minor drug use led to heroin. I'd like to know if Mr. Cruz has any information on that. And mm. since the Norwood News is published by Montefiore Hospital, has the, what is the hospital doing to help people get off of heroin? Okay, let me uh, ask that. Thank you, Bob. Let me ask that first question to Ms. Vizi, who's probably a little more qualified to talk about the, the, the development from one drug to the other. Marijuana to heroin still, I mean, you talked about painkillers. Are we still in that direction? Well, clearly we're still seeing marijuana as being a gateway drug. It's still classified that way uh, from a professional basis. If we look at, you know, the substance abuse history of a, of a client, we certainly generally see, nine times out of ten, marijuana as being an entry drug for a patient. So I would conclude that that is probably accurate. Okay. And, uh, I, I mean, I'm guessing what David's answer is going to be about Montefiore Hospital. And why I'm Montefiore Medical Center. I'm guessing that the relationship uh, doesn't include uh, the hospital and the newspaper is kind of somewhat independent, <laughs> so there's no relationship there. They are the, the parent company of the Norwood News, um, but I have to say I did do research, and they actually do have a holistic approach to treating heroin. It's not just trying to get them off the drug. It's, it goes sort of beyond that. Right. Unrelated, though, to your story uh, right. in, in that way. In other words, they don't feed off the story. They, they house the newspaper and all that. So uh, now let's go. Uh, Aldo Perez from the Northeast Bronx. Dawa is there. Aldo, how are you? How are you doing, Mr. Askovac? We're doing good. Um, we don't have a ton of time, but tell me about how serious this problem of K2 is in the borough of the Bronx. Well, actually, it's very serious, Mr. Askovac. Actually, is infecting uh, actually the age range between 12 to actually 55 years of old. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how this, widespread? Uh, I mean, I had heard from people I've talked to in the Bronx about different neighborhoods are saying, "Oh, we've got a problem. We've got a problem." Every neighborhood, many neighborhoods, widespread, isolated to a couple of neighborhoods. How big a problem? Actually, it's actually spread into within inner communities. Actually, within the African American and the Latino communities. You see this uh, very high, profoundly. You see mm -hmm. the within selling within only 24-hour deli grocery stores mm -hmm. of the K2. Um, actually, today I had a conference with the New York City Sheriff's Department, and actually they're working on an initiative to actually have it legislated in some way where actually there be some regulatory status where they can actually uh, confiscate the K2 from uh, deli bodegas within our inner community. Why is it why is it so widespread and why has it become such a big problem? Actually because it's very it's very inexpensive. You can actually buy it from either three to five dollars. And they actually it actually ranges uh, within a community where um, kids can find it accessible. You can go to a grocery store like if you were buying a soda and you can actually purchase it. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and what is the effect of this, and why do you see this as such a big problem? I see it as a big problem because it can actually cause uh, very serious side effects for long term, especially with mental health issues, with uh, psychological issues, also with issues with, uh, within the family settings, which can actually people actually deterring from uh, detoxing from the K2 into heroin. Mm -hmm. So that is a, a, another gateway drug is what, what you're alleging. What do you see as solutions, at least uh, by step solutions? What do we need to do first to address this? I can actually, we, we have a very good legislative uh, that actually are attracting this. Actually, uh, we have Senator Gustavo Rivera, uh, we have uh, Councilman Richie Torres, and we also have Assemblyman Jose Rivera, who will actually are very willing to have really act an awareness campaign. We also have a very good inspector in the 52nd Precinct, Inspector Hoffman, who's very cautious about everything in the community. We have a very effective uh, New York City Sheriff's Department, which really, uh, willingly wants to start an awareness campaign first before you, you, the legislation is set. Although we only have a moment, one more, one more quick question. You described to me a situation you saw on, I think it was Burnside Avenue or somewhere over there in that part of the Bronx, yes, where they're, you they're said there was a store that was... They're, they're, they're very so bloody that they're even selling it across the street from actually a city council. So they're, uh, they're, they're just selling it in, in a store, and you could walk in there as long as you know what to say. You can go and get it. Why, well, isn't, to, why isn't this just busted up? The reason why it's in is because the legislation on it is very vague. Oh. Um, it's very vague when interpretation of the law. So oh. being that it's very vague in interpretation of the law, they don't really know how to attack it and actually pronounce a, a, hmm. a legal action upon it. Well, so it sounds like we've got a lot to learn and a lot to do in combating this. Uh, Aldo Perez, thank you for bringing it to our attention and bringing it to uh, the attention of the people of the Bronx. And um, we'll keep talking about it, and as necessary, we'll have you back. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ackerman. Uh, Ms. Vizi, um, do you see it? Is I it, do. You I do see it. I do. I mean, I think the two pieces uh, that Mr. Perez talked about are important to talk about now, which is access. I mean, this is the first drug, right, that you can get from the neighborhood store which is, you know, the DEA has been trying to keep up on the chemical compounds and make those things illegal. But I call this drug the loophole drug because they're staying ahead of everybody. So they're putting in compounds into this synthetically that allow it to be on the street in a different way. That's one issue. The second most challenging issue for providers and for parents and for healthcare professionals, it's almost undetectable. It in labs, terms of bloodstream and Correct. Like From a toxicology standpoint, we can't always assess if a client has even been using it. So it's generally, like I said, it's a loophole. And when we do get to test it with certain strips that perhaps give a little bit more sensitivity to what is in someone's system, the courts may not use that admiss in admissible or admissibility in court in terms of either... <coughs> Uh, keeping somebody from dealing or keeping somebody from using. So from a parent perspective, from the citizens of the Bronx who are looking at their children and saying, I know there's something wrong, uh, it's almost, almost impossible to find out. And then secondly, the side effects are very different than regular cannabis. We're talking about very serious side effects, some of which are as serious as seizures, and then, um, you know, things like psychosis and hallucinogenic I kinds of things. There was a, a horrible story of a young uh, man who, uh, you know, kind of went crazy mm -hmm. and leaped off a building or out a window and, and died as a result. It certainly, uh, unfortunately, inspires erratic behavior. And I wanted ahead, to sure. mention, too, that the reason, um, I don't know how many people know this, but the Bronx District Attorney's Office hasn't prosecuted a K2 case mainly because... Has not prosecuted. Correct. Not because of the chemical makeup of this uh, of this drug it's constantly changing so for them to analyze what's in the uh, what's in the synthetic marijuana it would just take too long by then the case I, I guess uh, you know in some ways it's like uh, what they're finding with professional athletes and uh, you know the, the use of uh, uh, you know uh, steroids and those kinds of things are um, also 
continue to be created and continue to make it more challenging uh, to detect. Before we, uh, let me ask you first, um, before we get going, treatment courts, do, do we find that they're effective? We, did you find that uh, this notion of a court that deals with treatment in, in a less criminal way is effective? Well, it's part of it, but as uh, when I was interviewing Deborah, it looks like there's no integration model. D drug treatment court is just one aspect of getting better. There's a whole other stream of, um, I guess, other services that you need, but there is simply no integration model. Which gets us into the question that I did want to ask about um, uh, the, the addictive personality. You know, when we talked about uh, crime and, and cutting back on crime on this show, we tried to always get to the source and we talked about gang prevention and all those kinds of things. Is there a way to, because it seems to me if you've got this addictive personality, whether you go through painkillers, whether it's marijuana or whatever else, it's that addictive personality that's the issue much more so than the specifics of what chemical or drug that, that they're using. How do we address that? Can we address that? Well, I mean, I think it's a very interesting and important conversation. I mean, you know, from our perspective, we see addiction as a disease. And the same way that someone has diabetes, uh, someone may be an alcoholic, mm -hmm. and it's not something that you choose to do necessarily. You may have a propensity uh, that once you begin to drink or once you begin to take something experimentally, you know, it can't be stopped. It sort of is a cycle, if you would, of a domino effect where mm -hmm. you can't necessarily uh, begin or end. I mean, I think the issue is where drugs could take you. And that's the concern for both our young people and for all of these folks that are being, that are overdosing. Yeah. I mean, what's happening on the streets of the Bronx are, we're not seeing pure heroin anymore. We're seeing a cut up with fentanyl and some very, very serious chemicals that are causing perhaps more of an overdose. We, we've got to get out of here. And as David said, his three stories <laughs> were not enough. My half hour was also not enough. This is a large and serious issue. Um, real quick, 10 seconds, what would you like to see? What, uh, what answers are out there or what, what do we need to address? More funding for treatment centers? I'm sure you would agree well, with that. Well, certainly I would, but I think more importantly to make the citizens of the Bronx aware. You know, what's happening in the Bronx is an entree of what's happening around the country. And it's time for us to really have some conversations. And, and we just, uh, David Cruz from the Norwood News, thank you. Deborah Vizi from VIP Community thank Services. You, my pleasure. We just put the websites of both of those organizations on the screen. So if you have issues, you have questions, please check in, check out. Don't let things go. If you have suspicions about a friend, a neighbor, do it in a supportive way and help them get help. That's the bottom line here. Folks, and if you do have further questions or comments on anything you heard, on tonight's show or anything going on in the Bronx, and you can either email them to us and we'll find you the right people too. Uh, we're at Bronx Talk at bronxnet.org, or you put them on our Facebook page and we do read them on the air during future editions of our program. Please like Bronx Talk on Facebook and you can check out our archives, see all the old shows at uh, bronxnet.org. Bronx Talk is on the lower right navigation bar. Now, next week we go into a two part series about the public high schools. We take a look at low funding of high school sports, and one of our guests will be a Bronx teacher who finds himself in the DOE's rubber room because of his outspokenness on the issue. Then the week after, on June 22nd, a whole different point of view will feature a fantastic garden being expanded by my alma mater, Dewitt Clinton High School. And so that'll be great. Next couple of weeks, we hope to see you. Thanks to uh, producer Dolly Gonzalez, director Shirley Arrieta, all the cast of thousands, and we'll see you next week. think I'm trash, but they're wrong. Today I'm just an aluminum can, but one day I could be a stadium.